Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Sign of good church when you can't calm people down to sit down for church. They're all catching up with each other. It's good to see everybody. Good to see everybody. I'm Eric Loudermilk. I serve as the interim pastor here at Oasis at Conway Gardens, and we're so glad to have everyone today. A couple announcements. Uh, if you're new or you've been watching for a while and want to tell us more about yourself, take your device, click on Oasis, excuse me, www.oasis.conwaygardens.org, and click on I'm New and tell us more about yourself. Um, if you would like a handwritten visitor's card, you could just raise your hand and one of our ushers would bring that to you. A couple other announcements. This evening at 5.30... Cross Point has invited us to their Holloway holiday feast here in the back lawn. They've got it all decorated. Uh, a couple of the leaders joined them a couple years ago when we were considering uh, fellowshipping together, and it's a lovely time. This will serve as our sort of Thanksgiving dinner because back when the leaders were planning in the summer, in the midst of the height of the latest COVID surge, we felt it would be wise not to plan it. Well, now that things have calmed down and Cross Point is moving, there's outdoors. They've invited us to come join them. Uh, if you can, bring either a side dish, a drink, or dessert. So, Ron, that means you swing by Winn-Dixie, get a check cola, and come on over, okay? And then tonight at 710, uh, we're having an outing. Uh, the uh, members of the church are going to see uh, C.S. Lewis, the most reluctant convert in all of England at the Winter Park Regal Cinema. And uh, the link to buying tickets is on our Facebook page. We would love to have you. Adam Jinks is here helping us lead worship again this week. So let's stand and worship the Lord today. Good morning, church. Thankful and blessed to be able to worship with you this morning. God, we just breathe in your presence this morning, and we just thank you for this opportunity to be able to just praise you here, God. We thank you, and we'll sing of your goodness this morning. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. Oh, all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire in darkest nights you are close like no other i've known you as a father and i've known you as a friend oh i have lived in the goodness of god sing all my life all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able oh i will sing of the goodness of god your goodness is running after, it's running after me. 
Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Sing all my life, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. You may be seated. I thought today was going to be the second Sunday I get to wear a sweater in church. But I got here and it was warmer than I anticipated. So, it's good to see everybody. Um, we're going to begin today by reading uh, some selected passages from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, chapter, Matthew chapter 5, verses 20 through 48. Matthew 5, verses 20 through 48. While you're turning there, I'll say this is the last in our series uh, on animated doubt, serious conversations on skepticism and faith with people who say I don't believe. And so I'll mention the actual sermon title in just a moment. If you are able, we have different ages in here. If you're able, uh, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Matthew 5, verses 20 through 48. Verse 20, but I warn you, Unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 21. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you're even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. And if you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone... You are in danger of the fires of hell. Skip down to verse 27. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I am saying anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Skipping down to verse 31. These are kind of heavy. You have heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say to you, that a man who divorces his wife, unless she's been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. Verse 38. You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say don't resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek as well. Verse 43. You have heard the law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. What? Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as the children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love only those who love you, what reward is that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. Verse 48. But you are to be perfect. You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. 
Thank you for my friends who've come today to worship. Thank you for our friends online on Facebook and YouTube. We know we have families traveling today, and we have visitors who are watching. Be with us today, I pray, Lord, and help me to explain this most important concept of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We've been going through the book Letters to a Skeptic. Um, a son wrestles with his father's questions about Christianity. It's one of the best books I've ever read. Uh, I keep losing my copy because I often give it away. And um, then I have to get another one. And so if you're wrestling at all, if you're just new to this series, or you're beginning to get interested, I encourage you to get it. It's so prolific, you can buy it used for about a dollar. I, we may be out in the back. We had five copies last week, and I think Ron Jaffe got them all, and he's selling them in his eBay store or something. So, Anyhow, I'm going to do something different today. I'm actually going to read a portion of one of Ed Boyd's letters. Ed is on a journey of trying to figure out if he wants to believe in Christianity. This letter is Correspondence 26, Isn't the Christian Life Impossible to Live? Dear Greg, I've recently been reviewing our letters back and forth over the last few years. Greg, and I must say that we've really come a long way. At least I've come a long way. I still wake up some mornings and I can't believe I'm actually seriously considering all of this. But when I sit down and lay it all out before me, I have to seriously consider it all. I still have a good many questions and reservations and like, but I can honestly say it's starting to ring true. I'm beginning to think I'm largely over the, bump, the hump of this thing. I never thought I'd be saying that. Thanks for your persistence, son. Skipping ahead, I'd now like to shift gears somewhat. James, I don't know if you can hear it, but I've got a little feedback up here. Um, the questions I've been finding myself asking lately, Greg, aren't as much philosophical as they are practical. If I'm thinking about becoming a Christian, I need to know just what I'm getting into. So here's the problem. How can God really expect anyone to live up to his ideals? I mean, I consider myself to be a pretty good person. I've certainly gone out of my way to help the underdog a few times, more than most. But I also know that my life isn't as saintly as the Bible idealizes. Nor could it ever be. But this biblical ideal seems to me to be impractical, and unrealistic. So, for example, didn't St. Paul say somewhere that if you think about lust, it's the same thing as doing it? Come on! One bad thought and you're an adulterer? Who could possibly live up to this? A lot of Christians say they do, but I don't believe them. Skipping down now, he says, but it's not only the rigidity of the Bible's sexual ethics which bothers me. I remember hearing a priest preach on Jesus' commandment to love your enemies, and I thought to myself that this command would be the ruin of any nation that actually tried to live it. So too, Jesus said somewhere, that if someone steals your coat, you should offer him your shirt as well. Or if someone hits you on the one side of the face, you should offer him the other side to hit as well. Come on, I bet there's not a Christian in the state of Florida who would actually do that. So there's a part of me, Greg, which says that Christianity is true and I should believe it. But there's also a part of me that says, don't bother. Because you can never live it anyways. I'd rather just be a sinner with integrity than a hypocritical saint. Which, incidentally, is why I can't ever see myself stepping inside of a church, even if I do become a Christian. Help me out if you can. I'm open to it. With all my love, Dad. Maybe some of you are listening um, online because you too can't see yourself coming into a church. But think about those passages we read. As the Father says, isn't the Christian life impossible to live? Yeah, it sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? Matthew 5.20, I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than that of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you'll never enter, get into heaven. I mean, these guys would take their spices, their salt, their pepper, their cumin, and they would give a tenth of that. I'm not there. 
And then at the end of this section, Jesus says, you're to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And the Son says in reply, yeah, you've got to be perfect because God's perfect. So that's our title. Isn't the Christian life impossible to live? Or an alternative title, as Greg the Son says into his response, respond to his dad, it is impractical, unrealistic. In fact, it's impossible. So that's the point. Join me, Dad, and quit. If it's so impossible, just quit. You heard me correctly. Quit. And that is a responsible, correct response to what Jesus says. I quit. I can't do this. So I'm going to explain today how that's possible, how we can live out the impossible Christian life, and how you can say, I quit. So first, I want to tell you about a a sentence Paul says in a letter he wrote to a church in Galatia, namely that it's impossible to live up to God's standards. Here's what he says. It's clear to me that no one can be made right by trying to keep God's law. For the scriptures say that it's through faith a righteous person has life. It's impossible to be made right with God by keeping the rules. See, this is the heart of Christianity that's so hard to believe. That's why we need a Savior. We need Jesus to come in and forgive us of all this. Okay, all right. So that's a little bit of mind-blowing thought, Eric, but why does the Scripture talk so much about law? Well, a couple verses later, the apostle says that very answer. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to Abraham, he's referring to, to show people their sins. Now this is something that if you're a skeptic, you have a leg up on church people. Because we often get hung up on this. The law was never meant to be obeyed. It took me decades to come to grips with this. The Old Testament law was never meant to be obeyed. It was given to show people that they can't be right. Here here Paul says, The law was designed to only last until the coming of the child, Jesus, who was promised. It was to show people their sins. Well, maybe that letter is a little out of line. Maybe we translated it wrong. Well, what about another letter? He writes to the church in Rome. The law's purpose was to keep people from having excuses to show that the entire world is guilty before God. If anyone's wondering today, I'm I'm reading from the New Living Translation that makes Paul a little easier to understand. Verse 20, For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. In another letter, a different author writing to the Hebrews says something similar. Now, you may or may not remember, if you're not a church-going person, that uh, in the old part of the Bible, the Old Testament, the first half, if someone blew it with God, which they did regularly, they had to get an animal and sacrifice it to fix it. That system was a part of the law that we have to keep, had to keep as well. So this writer says, the law can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, Make perfect those who draw near to God. They they had to do these sacrifices every year, but they didn't make people right. They really only reminded them that something had to be done. So now back to these really high standards Jesus sets in the Sermon on the Mount. He tells us to love our enemies. Love our enemies. Hey, I can't even love my friends. You know, I can't. So if I can't love my friends, how much more difficult it is to love my enemies? Well, that's the point. It's impossible. Now, just please try to follow, because this is where most people give up, because they don't believe this is true. In fact, the leaders were talking today about the old hymn, And Can It Be, That God Should Die For Me. It's so crazy, it's hard to believe. So let me point out something else. A little further in this this letter to the Hebrews, the author says, um, we have been sanctified through the one offering of Jesus once and for all. Let me read on. Every priest, now he's talking about the Old Testament sacrificial system, stands at his daily service offering the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. 
But when Jesus had offered for all time his life a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, meaning it's done. Drop the mic, it's over. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. Hebrews 10, 14, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I think there's more packed into this verse than any other one sentence in all of Scripture. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, in this series of a conversation with skeptics, I've tried to appeal to my more skeptical friends through philosophy, which was out of my wheelhouse, with logic, even my own failed science experiment up here, blaming that on Glenn. By the way, I was turning the wrong knob. We figured out later. <laughs> the hot plate was fine. I've also appealed to history and tried to show that our decisions for faith or against faith are still decisions of faith. We have to make a choice. We have to believe which we think is right. And if we're not very careful, those are driven by bias. But when we take all the evidence, all, all the evidence and then try to push aside all of our bias, which is difficult, the conclusion is that he is there. If you followed along, you've also heard my rationale for why I believe the Bible is God's inspired words. We have over 5,000 manuscripts in Greek, matching an agreement of a rate of 99% agreement between the manuscripts. It's basically unheard of. That's, those 5,000 are about eight times more copies than we have of Homer's works. About 100 more times copies, 100 more manuscripts than we do of Aristotle's works in its original language. And it's roughly 800 times more copies than we have of Plato's works. We don't doubt those guys said what they said. But I've appealed to you through all those other things. Today I want to appeal to you from a different approach. I want to look at the Bible through grammar. Now, do we have any English teachers in here? The last time I talked about this, I thought Donna was an English teacher, but she's not, and she's not here today. Yes, grammatical approach. So let's take a look. So this morning, I had a decent breakfast this morning. Uh, that was about three hours ago, but I'm feeling pretty good right now. And so if you were an English teacher or if you teach language, this is how you would diagram it. In the past, you ate breakfast with the current result that you're fed. It's a simple sentence diagram with the past. Actually, it's not a uh, sentence diagram. It's a verb diagram with past on the left and present on the right. Here's another way to show it with just an X. A past event in the past, but this, this screen is showing simple past. Uh, like, I ate. But the slide that I just did show you, which is the next one, is I have eaten, and therefore I feel fed. Two different types of past tense used in most languages, simple past or past with events occurring in the front. Now let me tell you a story. The last time I explained this passage to the church was before we went on Facebook. And uh, the day before, uh, on a Saturday morning, I called Glenn, one of my closer friends, and I needed to talk to him about something. It was really early, and I said, what you doing this morning? He said, uh, Don and I are going out to breakfast. I said, really, where? He said, uh, I'm kind of hinting, a place called Kiki's. Uh, ever hear of it? And I was still kind of new to Orlando, but I'd been there once. So I said, yeah, I've been there once. I love it, but I've only been there once. Hint, hint. Awkward silence. Finally, I said, well, I got to run. Uh, see you at church tomorrow. And he goes, bye. And then I hung up the phone, stomach growling. Then Glenn Cox has the audacity to send me this picture on my phone. And I, I, I pull, in reviewing my notes this morning, I pulled this picture up after I ate breakfast. Now, I, I'm, I'll eat anything, so honestly, that breakfast was a leftover Greek salad. <laughs> so you might say this wasn't all their fault. But I saw these pancakes after I'd eaten, I had to eat more. So I made me a peanut butter sandwich this morning. But can you believe that? He sent that picture after I hinted I'd like to eat. Proof positive that at least for Glenn Cox, it's impossible to live the Christian life. Jesus says something later in Matthew about when I was hungry, you fed me. 
I guess Glenn never read that. But this is how it looks when grammatically we would map it out. Past tense. Next slide. So by a single offering, let's go to the other one that says uh, before that or after that. No, it's, it says hungry over here. Forward, 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 forward. Yeah, We may go back to this. Let's go forward one more. Do we not have it? Oh, I must have made a mistake in passing things on. Well, what it should say on the left was, was it invited? And on the right, hungry. So by his failure to ask me to go out to eat, I was hungry all Saturday morning. In fact, I've now read or talked about food all morning, so I'm hungry again right now. So Glenn's sin is still having an effect on the present. I texted Donna last night. I said, you're going to be here tomorrow. She said, nope. I said, good. Actually, Glenn's visiting his mother. Well, this is the verb tense for the word perfect. By a single offering, he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. This is the part that's so hard to understand for people who haven't come to to Jesus. Next slide. The verb tense of perfected indicates that Jesus' death in the past is effective in the present. Paul alludes to this in another letter to a church in a city called Corinth. He says, I passed on to you what's most important, that Christ died, past tense, for our sins. Paul meant now. Past tense with a present effect. Jesus died in the past. Now, that's the verb tense. How about the word perfected, the verb? Let's go to that. The definition of the verb perfected means total and complete. It was originally a term coined to talk about an engine that's perfectly running. Uh, Not a modern engine. This is Greco-Roman times. We think more like catapults and things like that. But in this passage, it's referring to a legal verdict. Completely acquitted. He's absolved us of all guilt. So here Jesus fixes the problem he gives us in Matthew 5. Be perfect as the Father is perfect. Now Christians use a $5 word for this called justification. And we have this little way of remembering this. We take the word and we break it up into parts. Just if I cation. And then we drop off the cation. You know, I think Stephanie's better at slides than William is. She's just rocking right with me. Just if I'd. And then we add this, never sinned. Just if I'd never sinned. Back to our verse in Hebrews. For by a single offering... He is perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Let's look at the last part of the verse. We have this other verb phrase, being sanctified. That's a different verb tense, and it's not even simple present. It indicates that in the present, this is a current, ongoing process. Now, Two chapters later in the same letter, in this letter, the writer says this, Therefore, meaning since Christ has done all this crazy good stuff for us, let's lay aside every weight and sin which sticks to us. In other words, they're still fighting sin, and you're a skeptic and you're wondering, should I consider following Jesus? I can't live that Christian life. Well, here it is in Scripture. We can't live it either. So Paul's, or the writer of Hebrews, is telling them, keep trying. Keep trying to lay off this sin. In fact, later he tells us, in your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of of death. So let's diagram that. Our being sanctified. Ongoing present. This verse has got more packed in it than any verse I know. Next slide. Here's it diagrammed. Ongoing in the present. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus, who was both man and God, died one time, and it made you perfect, perfect, 
even though you're constantly fighting sin all the time. Constant process. Now, we call that sanctification. And being sanctified means that we are still getting rid of sin. As I just said, the author of Hebrews says, let us lay aside every sin. Let's keep at it. Let's keep putting it away. They're still battling it. We've already established it's impossible to get right with God, to live the impossible life, so he justifies us. He makes us perfect one time, once and for all. But then what about this living afterwards? Well, this living and fighting against those things now is an act of gratitude. When we realize that this crazy story is true, how can it be that you would die for me? We live that way out of gratitude and worship. Here's that same verse, Hebrews 10, 14, if you're wondering, in one of the most modern translations there is, written by Eugene Peterson. This is the message. By that single offering, he did everything that's needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying, purifying process. Another uh, Greek dictionary for that word purified says to eliminate. Go to the next one if we have it. There we go. To eliminate that which is incompatible with holiness, to purify. I promise Glenn's not here because of anything I did. He just happens to not be here today. I wonder if his mother's listening. That's where he's visiting. No, we've not excommunicated him. Now, one last point, and then I'll wrap it up. You know, I've got a lot of slides today, but it's a very simple message. And it's, the gospel is so simple, and I even try not to say that because some people think the wrong thing. The word gospel, as you've heard me say many times, is just Latin for a good story, which goes back to the original New Testament phrase, good news. It's the great story of Jesus. It's so simple that he dies for all of our mess. So here's this last point. In uh, the chapter after this in Hebrews is a passage called, Christians called the the Hall of Faith. Early in this series, I mentioned that group of people and the heroes in the Hall of Faith because they didn't live up to God's standards but will be in heaven. God says he's, he's happy to call himself their God. And the most famous example of this is the Jewish saint Abraham, considered the father of the Jewish nation, who, though he had faith in God, occasionally lied, acted the coward, put his wife in the arms of another man twice, and the man did have those intentions. And Abraham even sort of slept with his own, one of his female servants. He's in heaven. And his wife Sarah, she's in the same list too, And by the way, she's the one who gave him that servant. The author of Hebrews tells us that God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a heavenly city. Maybe your righteousness is like Abraham's. But yet Jesus tells us our righteousness has to exceed that of the Pharisees. Well, that's because you get the righteousness of God through Christ. Noah the drunkard's in this list. Jacob the liars in this list. Moses the murderers in that list too. Now Hebrews 11.32. What more can I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, who was a coward, Barak, who was a coward, Samson, who was a womanizer, and Jephthah. Now, does Jephthah ring a bell? I look back in our first week's notes. We went over Jephthah as an example of this. He was too was in the book of Judges. And the crazy irony in the book of Judges is everybody was doing what they wanted to do in those days because there was no king. And so even the best leaders in Israel were really messed up sinners. So Jephthah led Israel in battle against the child-sacrificing nation of the Ammonites. Ironically, he was so distorted in his faith uh, that he vowed that after the battle he would sacrifice the first thing that crossed his threshold when he got home. His daughter crossed the threshold and he didn't go, oh, I made a stupid vow, I better, I better drop that. No, he killed her. He's in heaven. 
Why? Because he was looking forward to the promise of a righteousness that succeeded his own. He's perfected through Jesus Christ. So if that guy can be in the hall of faith, so can you. The biblical ideal is imperfect, but you can be perfect. Because by a single offering, God has perfected for all time those who are today being sanctified. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, a major verse in my life, for our sake he became sin, who knew no sin, Jesus. Jesus became sin. He didn't dip his foot in it. He became sin itself. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's messed up. Isn't that what we'd say on the street? That's jacked up. Jesus becomes sin and I become the righteousness of God. Not that I get to dip my toe in the righteousness. I become the righteousness of God. That's messed up. That's why the hymn writer said, And can it be that my God would die for me? So the Christian life isn't about doing what you don't want to do or not doing what you want to do. It's about allowing Christ to change what you want to do. He makes you perfect and righteous from God's perspective once and for all. And then going forward, He changes what you want to do. Now some of that happens instantly. Paul tells us that if we're in Christ, we're a new creation. And I've told the story before about my friend Ralph Pisani who gave his life to Christ in the 80s and his wife of 40 years, she was a believer that whole time, said that night he was a changed man. Instantly something changed. And then slowly other things change gradually. Some with epiphanies along the way. Sometimes you wake up, oh, I've been an idiot. And some of this happens internally, mysteriously, almost in a non-conscious way. Um, we're going to have a baptism next week, which I forgot to announce. I'll let you come and see who it is. But this person said when they chose Christ, somehow they quit being angry as much. It just happened. Then at the conscious level, the more we understand this crazy story about God that he'd rather die and hold himself accountable for our sins, the more this happens consciously and we want to live a life of gratitude and worship. So here are the impossible ethics of the Sermon on the Mount. Throw up your hands. Confess, I can't do it. I quit. That is the, res the correct response to Jesus. In fact, in the movie tonight, we'll see that of C.S. Lewis. He wasn't happy about it. Someone told me last week this girl scared them. <laughs> She's not happy. I quit. You're God. I can't do it. You better do something for me. Or this. I give up now. I'm so sick and tired of trying. It's up to you. So it's real simple. You quit. You confess your need. You receive his sacrifice. And you follow him. I am guilty Ashamed of what I've done What I've become These hands are dirty I dare not lift them up To the Holy You plead my cause, you ride my rocks, you break my chains, you've overcome, you gave your life to give me mine, you say that I am free, how can it be? How 
can it be? I've been hiding, afraid I've let you down. Inside I doubt that you still love me. But in your eyes there's only grace now. You plead my cause, you ride my wrongs, you break my chains, you've overcome, you gave your life to give me mine, you say that I Adam's going to keep playing here. We quit. We confess our need. We receive his sacrifice and we follow him. Easter 2019, I preached a message and we had ladders on the stage and we had a craft where everybody put together their own ladder and they all looked rickety and the altar call was to come up and throw your ladder down give up and quit trying to climb to God because Jesus has climbed down the ladder to us. You just quit. In a moment, I'm, we're going to bow our heads and pray and I'm going to lead you in a silent prayer where you can, once again, tell the Lord you want to do that. But maybe you're thinking, I'm still not there. Last week we talked about the man who said, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Let me give you another example. One of my good friends, Gerald, who has spoken here before, tells the story of a young woman, a Muslim woman, he was sharing Jesus with. And she was profoundly moved by his role as a prophet, but she was confounded by his claim to be God. You may not believe it, but she comes home from the grocery store and sets her groceries down and turns around and there's Jesus standing in her kitchen. He says, follow me. She says, Isa, I can't. That's the Arab word for Jesus. Isa, I can't. I can't say that you're God. Isa says, just follow me. 
And if you go back and read the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus didn't say, have your doctrine right, have flawless, perfect faith. In fact, he comes up to Matthew, the writer of our text today, the evil tax collector, and he just says, follow me. You don't have to have flawless faith. You can just admit, I I don't know where else to go. I believe this enough that I want to pray this prayer and get started with you. But I don't have flawless faith. Let's bow our heads. If that's you, or even if you're a believer and you say, I'm just now finally figuring out how this works. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I quit. I give up. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired of trying to be good enough. And I'm also sick and tired of trying to figure it all out of how you can be there and do this for us. So I quit. I give up. I confess that I need you even though I don't know how it all works. And yes, I want your sacrifice. I take it. I don't even know how to take it, God. How do I receive the sacrifice of you on the cross? So however that is, God, let me do that now. And yes, just like the sinner Matthew, I'll follow you. Show me how. If you prayed that, you are now in the kingdom of God. And you may be an animated doubter or an early believing Christian now or a follower of Jesus. Just follow him. In fact, this change that we talk about that happens when you come to Jesus and your life starts to change didn't really happen to me much as a youth because I didn't really understand this. It's only when I really quit about 10 years ago that I saw the change. Now, for believers, this is our time in the message where we talk about our sins this week. Adam's going to play a verse or a chorus or a bridge, and I want you to think a minute about this week's mess-ups. And I want us to bring that to God. So close your eyes again. You say, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I proved it this week that I'm I'm a flawed follower. Just think about those things where you blew it this week. Today is your reminder that He's perfected you for all time. When God sees you, it's like a sparkling diamond. So lay those at Jesus' feet again today. Father, we thank you once again that we don't know how it can be that you've forgiven us. Your word says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're dealing with the past today, Jesus. And we look forward to the future. But for today, we're in the middle. And we want to follow you in the middle. Lord, we also lift up people in our church who are hurting. We thank you that Faye Henderson's surgery went well this week. We pray that she would continue to heal. That Shirley Donaldson would continue to heal and grow stronger. For Floyd and Ann, especially Floyd, who continues to have bad days and the doctors can't figure it out, I pray for healing in his life. Dear God, for Laurie Williams here today, who's lost two sisters this week, help her to understand that grieving and expressing that grief and pain is perfectly natural. And I pray that you would comfort her, but that you would help us to draw around her and comfort her. For Debbie Sharnetsky, who's Kathy's sister who's had cancer, now having COVID this week, her and her husband, please protect Debbie and Dave and bless their sister Chris who's had a stroke. Father, there's more needs than are mentioned. There are those in our congregation and under the sound of our voice through media that are hurting right now. I pray, God, you would meet them in the middle right now and bless them and fill them. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm not enough. Let's stand. You have lyrics with you.
Will you meet me here again? Cause all I want is all you are. Will you meet me here again? Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, dry bones awaken. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. You plead my cause. You right my wrongs, you've broken my chains, you've overcome, you gave your life to give me mine, you say that I am free, how can it be? How can it be? Though I fall, you can make me new. From this death, I will rise with you. Oh, the grace reaching out for me how can it be we receive it how can it be sing you please my you plead my cause you plead my cause you ride my rungs you break my chains, you've overcome, you gave your life to give me mine, you say that I am free, how can it be? How can it be? Oh, we may have lost my phone. Oh, there we are. Okay. Hey, we're going to get through this. If you're a visitor or guest, the giving responsibility is regular attenders and members. So that's not a pressure today. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for giving to us. And as we give back to you, we remind ourselves that it's out of gratitude for this crazy story of what you've done. This profound contradiction that the God of the universe would rather hold himself accountable than hold me accountable. Just doesn't make sense. So God, as we give, I ask today that you would bless these families in their homes, bless them financially, even as you're blessing them spiritually. Touch the hurts in these homes. God, then give us wisdom with these funds to use them to tell this story to others. We give you this time. In Jesus' name. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like seas below Whatever my lot Thou hast 
has taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul It is well, it is well with my soul, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the stand for this last verse here. And Lord, haste the day when the face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so. sense the sweet presence of the Lord Jesus because his is a gentle presence who has already died so that you can be at peace we love you all it's great to see you have a good week hey if you stuck around long enough for the end of this video I just want to thank you again for watching and I hope you enjoyed it if I could, I just want to take one more second of your time today to ask you and encourage you to subscribe to our channel on YouTube and also to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. All three of those accounts are under the name Oasis at Conway Gardens. And if I could, I want to encourage you to like videos, comment on them, and even share them to your own social media accounts. Now this is not a way for the church to become more popular and we don't make any money off of likes, comments, or shares. This is just a way for us in a digital age to be able to share the gospel. 
We want to get the good news of Jesus Christ and his love for us out to a broken and hurting world. And this is one of the best ways that we can do that. So if you could take just a second to go follow our social media accounts, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and maybe the next time you watch one of our videos, hit the like button, comment on it, or share it to your social media accounts if you feel compelled to do so. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for joining us and have a great week.